in the early part of the 19th century. The idea that Britain had a duty to communicate to those subject to its rule. The blessings and benefits of the European condition held a wide currency. Britain's imperial purpose, it was argued, was not simply the grubby pursuit of profit, but rather a commitment to bring light into the darkest corners of the world. Britain had to embrace the responsibilities of empire, to which it had been called by providence. These wider global commitments found expression in the missionary movement abroad and the anti-slavery campaign at home, both underpinned by the belief that the great mass of mankind could and would be transformed. I think evangelical Christianity has an important impact on uh, attitudes towards race. And I think there is a the first half of the 19th century um, attitude, which is um, in some ways idealistic and also rather unrealistic. I think there is the hope that as they, the other, black and brown others, become subject to British rule, uh, civilizing mission, the impact of Christianity, they will um, gradually, somehow, by some magic, turn into brown and black Englishmen and women. I think there's an enormous evangelical hope that that will happen. The sort of high point of universalist thinking, of the kinds of thinking which was, you know, we are all, we are all the same, we can all become the same. And what underpinned that was that every, everybody can become like us. I mean, that was really what was imagined in the abolition campaigns. You know, we are brothers under the skin and the skin doesn't matter. But the skin did matter. And the, the problem is that after emancipation, when it became clear that emancipated Africans were not going to fit quite as easily into a picture of industrious, you know, hard-working, domesticated men and women, which was what the abolitionists had imagined, then a sense of disappointment, a sense of economic failure, uh, arguments begin to emerge about how emancipation hasn't worked, you know, it's an experiment that hasn't worked. And what goes with that is new ways of articulating the differences between peoples that can no longer rest on, you know, the problem is slavery, now there has to be something else. So the problem is, you know, the problem is civilization, the problem is, you know, these forms of barbarism which are still there. And they are, of course, associated also with skin and bones and hair and all those things. So there's a, there's a physical aspect to it. But I don't think that, I don't think that biological notions of race are the key to it. I think that it's a civilizational index which is really critical. Abolitionists were increasingly on the defensive over the question of emancipation in the West Indies. Those public men who had always opposed the abolition of slavery now became more forthright in their opinions. Events in the Caribbean demonstrated, it was claimed, the essential inferiority of black people. They were born to be mastered and had only been briefly lifted out of barbarism by their enforced enslavement and encounter with Europe. Whilst the empire's white subjects might be capable of self-government, those colonies with substantial black populations were not. Those optimistic, progressivist, and for that matter, arrogant British ideas about how empire was going to develop were dealt a further blow by a series of events in the colonies. The so-called Indian Mutiny of 1857 and the Morant Bay Rebellion in Jamaica in 1865, both dramatic rejections of British authority, forced missionaries and their supporters to recognise that colonial rule was not a simple matter at all. The empire's non-white subjects 
were perhaps less men and brothers, but rather children who needed responsible and at times forceful parents. Although there was no doubting Britain's civilizational superiority, the extent to which British rule could transform, however gradually, the races or peoples under its care was a contested issue. Let us take the Negro as we find him, announced the speaker at a meeting of the Anthropological Society of London in 1866. As God designed him, not a white man, nor the equal of a white man. For those who believed all peoples were the descendants of Adam and Eve, the differences between races could be explained by differences in culture and climate. This didn't mean that all were equal, but given the chance and the right conditions, the level of civilization attained by European culture might be reached by all. At the same time, there were those who focused on ideas of permanent physical difference and inherited characteristics to explain the fundamental differences between peoples. These two discourses on race, that of cultural differentialism and that of biological racism, were both used to uphold racial hierarchies that progressed from savagery to civilization and ultimately featured white Anglo-Saxons at their apex. They were perhaps not two different systems, but rather racism's two registers. There's no doubt that various scientific developments during the 19th century feed into a set of arguments about race. The argument can be overstated, however. Um, there are lots of different factors go into making racial arguments. And evolutionary claims post-Darwin can be used for completely contradictory and conflicting political visions. So, for example, you've got social Darwinists who thought that the main lesson that could be learned from Darwin's work was that the races of the world are going to end up in perpetual conflict with one another and that uh, the strongest would win out in the long run. Deeply pessimistic, racist, um, competitive view could also be used to support unfettered capitalism and a variety of other social practices and institutions. At the same time, you had people like Prince Kropotkin, anarchists, arguing that the lesson to be learned from evolution was that human harmony was natural and that cooperation was what uh, was ordained by nature. So even if we take the lessons that were drawn from evolution, they're politically indeterminate and conflicting. Scientific developments certainly played a role but not for everyone. You didn't and don't need to believe in an evolutionary theory to be a racist. Ideas of racial hierarchy had existed prior to the 19th century, but had been supported by philosophical and religious rather than scientific arguments. The growth of pseudo-scientific racial theories were tributaries that fed into an existing stream of racial thinking in the later 19th century and gave it new form. There's no doubt that at least some people, including some very prominent people, did think that science now legitimated views about race and human society. Science has huge cultural authority. It does now and it did then. And to be able to make arguments about social life, and in particular ones about the relations between peoples, between cultures, and to dress this in the language of science, is to make a very powerful ideological claim one that is extremely effective in shaping the way that people think about the nature of the world. The idea that certain races, certain groups of people, were living, expanding communities, whilst others were failing, dying ones, could and did shape relationships between coloniser and colonised. In Australia, most strikingly, Interaction with Aborigines was often underpinned by a grim, self-consoling conviction that it didn't matter too much how these people were being treated because they were a race doomed to die out anyway. 
although the belief in the essential unity of mankind still remained a powerful one for some people. By the end of the 19th century, the negative representation of other races or peoples as inferior to white Britons could be found in many different cultural forms. If you look at the outpouring of children's literature, the books for boys, books for girls, in the latter part of the 19th century, they almost always back that line up. So do school textbooks, by the way. They back the line up that black and brown people, particularly black people, are inherently um, inferior, more or less incapable of improvement, that they will um, sort of hobble around in the lower depths of colonial society and they will do some menial jobs and they will be useful, but they can never really aspire to the heights reached by white men and women. And that's probably beyond their capability. And that is, I think, uh, sort of a, an unspoken understanding which gains enormous currency through literature for children, liter literature for grown-ups even. Look at John Buchan's, a lot of John Buchan's writing towards the end of the 19th, early 20th century, in which Jews and blacks and other people are sort of written off as, um, well, inferior, basically. And I think that seeps into society. School textbooks talk about the hopeless delinquency of the freed slave in the Caribbean. They, you know, they just write people off. And I think that has a drip, drip impact on um, young people being educated because from 1870, after the Foster Education Act, almost every child is educated at least up to the age of 11 or 12. That wasn't happening before. And they're being subjected often. Uh, they may have liberal teachers, but the school textbooks are frequently illiberal. <laughs>